The auto settings on digital cameras have come a long way. They can yield some fantastic results, but it isn't always ideal. Sometimes you'll find photos are too dark, too blurry, or really grainy. If you don't have a problem with this and like to keep things simple, then by all means, stick with the auto setting. But if you find yourself sometimes frustrated and want to take more control over your photos, I've got some tips, tricks, and techniques that will help you get the most out of your camera. Every time I turn my camera on, the first setting I check is my white balance. If you've ever taken a photo that turned out kind of blue or orange, it means that the camera was somehow tricked into thinking you were shooting under the wrong light source. This is a good place for us to start because it's the most simple to remedy. Just look around. If you're outside in the daytime and the sun is shining, select sunny or outdoor. If you're outside in the daytime but the sky is overcast, select cloudy or overcast. And the same goes if you're shooting in the shade by selecting shade. Things get a bit more complicated when shooting inside where you might be faced with a combination of light sources. Right now I have the lights on, which are tungsten balanced, but there is also some light coming in through the windows. If I choose tungsten lighting and take a photo, some of the areas of the photo have the proper white balance where others look kind of blue tinted. And if I choose the outdoor settings, some of the frame will appear too orange. To get around this, try and determine which light source has the most intensity and go with that. If your overhead lighting is brighter, just close the blinds and go with tungsten. Or turn off the overhead lights and go with cloudy or outdoor. Camera flash units are balanced to daylight, so sometimes I like to keep the overhead lights off and use a flash unit in combination with outdoor lighting. This will make colors that are recreated a lot more accurate to real life. But it won't help much when it comes to photos that turn out too dark or too bright. When it comes to getting proper exposure, the first thing you need to pay attention to when shooting in manual is your camera's light meter. It's this little series of dots and numbers on the LCD screen or viewfinder. Those numbers indicate stops of light, and the dots in between them break those stops down into thirds. The trick to getting a properly exposed photo is to adjust your shutter, aperture, and ISO until the little arrow or dot lines up in the middle. It's important to mention that there are a few situations where the light meter might not be completely accurate. For instance, if you're shooting outside during the winter and there is a lot of snow on the ground, your camera might be tricked into thinking that it's properly exposed when in fact it's underexposed. So you may need to adjust some settings to move the light meter into the positive side to ensure you don't lose too much detail in the darker areas of the frame. If you're inside and taking photos by a window that is letting in a lot of light, your camera might think it's properly exposed when in reality the images are turning out very underexposed or too dark. It's always a good idea to position yourself so windows are behind the camera. This is a great way to make the best of free natural lighting and avoid having your subject appear as a silhouette. But if this isn't an option for you, you'll have to adjust the settings again to bring the light meter into the plus side to bring out all those lost details. Thankfully, there's only three settings that you need to adjust. Let's start off by taking a look at ISO. This affects how sensitive your camera's imaging sensor is to light. I could go into a lot of really boring detail about native and extended ISO, but the only thing that's really important to know is the higher the ISO number, the brighter your photos will become. But it also means the more noise will be introduced into the image. This is something you'll want to avoid, and each model of camera handles higher ISOs differently. For example, here's a photo taken with the Canon T2i using an ISO of 6400, and here's a similar photo taken with the Canon 5D Mark III under the same lighting conditions, also at ISO 6400. When viewed side by side and enlarged, you can see that the entry level T2i has a lot more noise than the 5D. Knowing how far you can push your camera's ISO without introducing a bunch of noise is important, so try pushing yours to see how far it can go. Moving on, let's take a look at shutter speed and how that affects images. To break it down to basics, the longer the shutter is open, the more light is allowed through the lens and onto the image sensor, which makes your photo brighter. Using a slower shutter speed will introduce motion blur, while increasing the shutter speed high enough will make fast-moving objects appear frozen in time. These can both be very cool effects, but sometimes using a slow shutter speed can ruin your shots. If you find that your photos are turning out blurry when shooting handheld, that means your shutter speed needs to be increased. 
A good rule to follow is to at least match your focal length with your shutter speed. This means that if you're shooting with a 50mm prime lens like this fantastic Canon 50mm f1.8, otherwise known as the Nifty 50, you should stick to a shutter speed of 1 over 50 or higher. This will reduce or eliminate the blur caused by holding your camera while taking photos. If you're taking photos at night or in a dark room and a high shutter speed isn't an option, then you'll need to use a tripod, which is something everyone with a camera should invest in. You don't need anything fancy. In fact, of all the tripods that I own, I find myself using this cheaper one by Vanguard the most. It's lightweight and fast to set up, but most importantly, it holds my camera still. I also like to use my camera's two second timer when using a long exposure, even when it's on a tripod, because simply pressing the shutter button can cause a little bit of camera shake, and that can be enough to blur up a photo. If you're taking pictures of children, pets, or sports, it's best to increase your shutter speed to at least 1 over 200. And if you're shooting indoors without enough light to pull that off, you might need to use the camera's pop-up flash if you absolutely have to. I am not a big fan of the pop-up flash. Instead, I use an external flash connected to the camera's hot shoe. You don't have to spend big bucks on a flash unit either. Here's a shot taken with the Canon Speedlight 600EX2RT, and here's the same picture taken with a newer TT560 Speedlight. There isn't much of a difference, if any, except for the price. The Canon will set you back well over $600, and the newer is around $60. The Canon does feature a lot of bells and whistles, but if you just plan on using it on top of your camera like this, then it's really hard to justify paying over 10 times as much. That is, unless you want to use a shutter speed higher than 1 over 200, you'll need a feature called High Speed Sync for that. Otherwise, you'll see that a portion of the frame will be black. This is due to the way that a shutter curtain operates. For the sake of time, I won't go into any detail on this, but plenty of information is available online. And I might also make a more detailed video covering camera flashes in the future. And finally, I saved my personal favorite setting for last, aperture. This will affect the depth of field, which is a fancy way of saying how wide or narrow the area of focus will be. When you adjust the f-stop on your camera, it's actually opening or closing a little window inside the lens to either allow more or less light to pass through. I personally believe this is where you'll see the biggest difference in your photos. Check this out. Here's a photo taken with the Canon T2i using the aforementioned Nifty 50 at f22. Most of the photo is in sharp focus, which is great and all, but here's another photo taken at f1.8. Like I said, it's a huge difference. As you can see, the foreground and background is all blurred out. The photographic term for this is bokeh, and it can give your shots an incredible look by drawing attention towards what you choose to remain in focus. You may have heard the term fast glass before. This is what photographers call lenses that have an aperture of f2.8 or lower. They're usually more expensive than lenses with the same focal length, but only offer a maximum aperture of f3.5, like this Canon 18-55mm kit lens, for example. This is why the Nifty 50 with its maximum aperture of f1.8 is such a great lens to pick up early on. It's limited in focal length and has no image stabilization, but it makes up for it with its speed. You might also be confused when I refer to f1.8 as being the maximum aperture. This is because f-stops are measured by the diameter of their opening. At f1.8, it's opened up as much as possible, and at f22, it's closed as much as possible, making it the Nifty 50's minimum aperture. So, can I tell you what ISO shutter and aperture settings to use to get the perfect exposure every time in any setting? No. Adjusting these three settings to achieve a good exposure while also getting the look you want is a balancing act and sometimes a test of patience, but it all comes in time. You'll most likely find yourself getting frustrated, but don't get discouraged. Nobody started out taking perfectly exposed photos in manual mode. Like many people, I believe that photography should create an emotional response, either by the people looking at the final product or in the photographer while they're looking through their camera. Those emotions won't always be pleasant, especially at first, but if you approach it as a challenge, you will eventually feel a sense of accomplishment, because it won't be your camera calling the shots. Those photos truly will be your creations. So why not give the manual mode a shot? And I hope you tune in again next time for some more tips, tricks, and techniques to help you get the most out of your camera.